last speaker of the of a conference. Um, someone it would be uh, possible not to know of. Uh, if one works on Newton, Professor Mordecai Feingold, Professor uh, of History at California Institute of Technology since 2002. He has asked me to keep this short, so uh, I'll just mention a couple of his many, many uh, achievements and publications. Uh, his most recent book, celebrated at an event at the Royal Society last November, is Newton and the Origin of Civilization, co-authored with Jeb, uh, Jed Buchwald. Uh, <clears throat> some of the other books uh, on Newton, The Newtonian Moment, and Before Newton, The Life and Times of Isaac Barrow. He's uh, twice a recipient uh, of Mellon Foundation grants. He has many, many other credits um, to his name, uh, as, as we know. Uh, he's doing the census um, the first of the first edition of the Principia, and he's going to be speaking to us today uh, about the legacies of the General Scolium. Thank you, Aria. I would like to thank first to the four S's that brought us here, Steve, Stefan, Scott, and the Scolium. <laughs> Uh, when uh, Steve asked me to speak, I wanted to talk about polemics in Newton's general scoliums because it suits my personality better. But Steve refused and he gave me legacies. So of course legacies is in the plural and in the final version there will, there will be many legacies uh, which include natural religion, experimental philosophy, methodology, modesty, and so on and so forth. However, since I cannot speak in 32 minutes on all of them, I decided to focus on one. So I, will, I shall create polemics, at least someone should do it, um, and it uh, uh, complement and engage with Scott's, with uh, Dimitri, uh, uh, with Eric, and some other uh, papers. Um, purposely because in order to discuss what is the focus or, or the central part of the scolium religion, I believe we, we must disengage the scolium from controversies over the Trinity. That will enable us to understand the legacies better. So that's what I will try to do in this particular paper. And uh, I'm happy in the discussion to broach uh, some of the other legacies as well. Uh, and obviously, to be the last on the program, <coughs> In, I mean, in a conference that is devoted to four pages uh, to repeat something that was said before is uh, uh, natural. So I will begin with something that Scott uh, started, but hopefully it will facilitate discussion. In, seven, in uh, 1715, John Maxwell published a discourse concerning God, which purported to demonstrate, I quote, that God is not rightly defined a being absolutely perfect, but that he is more rightly defined a spiritual being endued with absolute dominion. Maxwell insisted on the impossibility of proving a God a priori, or any otherwise, than from his dominion, that is, by arguing from the effect to the cause. Grounding himself on the 20th query of the Optiche, as well as on Proposition 6 of Book 3 of the Principia, Maxwell argued that the motions of the planets and comets demonstrated the existence of vacuum, from which it followed a priori that there is a self-existent being which is not matter, and that this being is eternal, omnipresent, similar, and unchangeable by the necessary connection between self-existence of these attributes. <coughs> Conversely, he, he noted, to prove a priori that the self-existent being is intelligent is impossible, for only by arguing from the effects to the cause could such a proof be made, namely from his dominion. <coughs> Maxwell considered at some length the precise nature of God's providence and dominion, drawing on a range of authorities, including Samuel Clarke, John Pearson, Ralph Cadworth, Richard Baxter, and William Sherlock, all of them in order to substantiate the claim that pagans and Jews, Muslims and Christians, were all united in ascribing God's name to governing providence and not to a being considered as absolutely perfect. Having further pondered the various meanings of God's name, Maxwell determined, this attribute is in a sense coincident with Pantocrator, i.e. universal emperor, and consequently, the name or attribute of God, Pantocrator, is wrongly translated in scripture as well as in the creed as almighty. <coughs> 
This discussion prompted Maxwell to draw several conclusions, including that whosoever defines God as a being absolutely perfect, as did Descartes, does in consequence promote atheism. Conversely, and necessarily, any who denied the governing providence of the self-existing being will come into the definition of God as a being absolutely perfect. And then, with Spinoza, they will explain that away so as to mean nothing else by it than the material world. Maxwell acknowledged openly that the per perusal of the general scolium had occasioned his turning his thoughts in the following manner to the subject. Moreover, at the request of some of his acquaintances, who, not understanding the original, were willing to know that the, what the author derived, uh, delivered concerning God, he had opened his treatise, the first complete translation of the scolium into English. I dwelled at some length on the discourse, not only because, to borrow David Hume's phrase, it fell dead born from the press and has been ignored ever since, rather the discourse attests to the broad interest generated by the publication of the general scolium. Beyond its scientific import, the scolium furnished the first public pronouncement regarding the theological and metaphysical foundations of Newtonian natural philosophy, very terrible news indeed. While the major French periodicals, the Journal des Savants and the Memoirs de, Memoir de Trevaux, initially ignored the scolium, French readers could have found lengthy summary of and extract from it in Jean de la Clerc's uh, effusive review of the second edition of the Principia in the Bibliothèque Ancienne et Moderne. Leclerc paid particular attention to Newton's statements regarding God as the Lord of Dominion, adding his own support to the etymology of Elohim. Newton, Leclerc also noted, saw through the attempt by Spinoza and his followers to teach blind necessity, the greatest chimera that ever fell into the human mind. And he liberally cited from Newton's alternative account of the system of the world. It is to be wished, the review concluded, that Newton could find the experiments he needed in order to speak more positively, positively on such matters. Understandably, the review in the Acta Eroditorum proved much more critical. Probably written by Leibniz, it offered a brief and rather indifferent summary of the scolium, the conclusion of which cut Newton to the quick. He responded immediately by adding three pages to his anonymous review of his own anonymous Commercium Epistolicum, published in the Philosophical Transaction in 1715. Newton restated his views concerning hypothesis, experimental philosophy, and the reasons for his reluctance to assign a cause to gravity before giving vent to his fury. And I quote something that has already come before. And yet, the editors of the Acta Eroditorum have told the world that Mr. Newton denies that the cause of gravity is mechanical, and that if the spirit or agent by which electrical attraction is performed be not the ether or subtle matter of Descartes, it is less valuable than a hypothesis, and perhaps may be the hierarchic spirit of Dr. Henry Moore. And Mr. Leibniz had accused him of making gravity a natural or essential property of bodies, and an occult quality and miracle. And by this sort of raillery, they are persuading the Germans that Mr. Newton lacked judgment and was not able to invent the infinitesimal calculus. Newton proceeded to carefully differentiate his methodology, natural philosophy, and theology from Leibniz's, contributing thereby to Leibniz's determination to publicly assault the, the orthodoxy of Newtonian natural philosophy. Not worthy is that by then, Newton had already taken steps to disseminate the general scolium among continental readers, a move that may have further fortified Leibniz's resolve to respond. In November 1713, William Barnett, Newton's close friend, dispatched Cotte's preface together with the scolium to Willem Schravesande in the hope that they would be published in the Journal Littéraire. Schravesande was also asked to transmit the text to Celestino Galliani, including a cover letter from Barnett urging Galliani to circulate them widely. Galliani obliged, and the scolium became pivotal to the reception of Newtonian science and British natural theology in Italy. Interest in the general scolium intensified in subsequent years. It became central to Clark's response to and critique of Leibniz's letter to Princess Caroline. In the published version of the exchange, 1717, 
Clark occasionally cited form and uh, referred the reader to corresponding pages of the scholium. The correspondence garnered even broader uh, readership through its inclusion three years later in Pierre de Maizière's collection of several pieces, thereby ensuring that by the 1720s, the scholium had become integral part to philosophical and theological debates on the continent, as well as in England. At the same time, however, the, interwine, the interwining of the specificities of the scholium with the broader range of metaphysical and moral topics tended to mask the distinctiveness of Newton's contribution. A parallel embroilment of the scholium in contemporary theological disputes further affected its reception as well as we shall see more fully below. <coughs> John Maxwell then exhibited shrewd foresight in attempting to capitalize on the publication of the scholium. Whether he hoped to carry favor with Newton or gain admission to the Royal Society cannot be determined at this stage. Whatever the motivation, Maxwell's treatise appeared at an inopportune moment. Within months, the leibniz clark correspondence uh, subsumed the energy of the Newtonians, while the raging debate of the Trinity discouraged others from publicly discussing philosophical issues that ostensibly border on heterodoxy. Joseph Butler, for example. Before turning to these debates and assessing the impact on the future reception of the scholium, however, I would like to reflect on the context that gave, gave rise to the scholium and the originality of its theology. As noted above, Maxwell grounded his discussion of God's name and dominion on a variety of orthodox sources, in addition to the scholium. And such eclecticism should caution us against assuming that Newton relied on anti-Trinitarian or Socinian sources. The matter of God and his attributes, in fact, had been prominent feature of theological discourses at least since the 1650s, especially in discussions of the, Apostle, the Apostles' Creed, the opening sentence of which reads, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of the heaven and hells. Two influential treatments of the creed were made by Newton's older contemporaries at Trinity College, John Pearson and Isaac Barrow, and both of them have uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the creed in front of them, and Barrow actually has a whole sermon devoted to Pantocrator. But the scholium probably owed considerably more to a hitherto neglected source, uh, uh, Stefan mentioned it, Peter and, and uh, uh, Scott in uh, a previous article, uh, Stephen, uh, uh, Peter King's The History of the Apostle Creed, written by Newton's friend, Peter King. Newton, who owned the copy, would have found a lengthy discussion of the various expositions of the creed by the early church fathers, leading up to the Nicene Creed. According to King, in response to the multiplication of deities by the early Christian heretics, the creed maintained belief in one God, which, being understood relatively, signified that one and the same God is the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Basing himself on numerous authority, King argued that Pantocrator was the commonly used term to signify the Almighty in the early church. The term properly signified the universal dominion of God over all creatures and his providential regency and gubernation of them. Pantocrator may be considered as the dominion of God's infinite power and energy by which he made the world of nothing and he needed no coexistent matter where, where on to show the effi uh, efficacy. And I'll cut the rest. All of which led King to conclude that, uh, what, uh, uh, that by ascending to this term almighty in this part of the creed, it is thereby declared that the power of God is omnipotent, his dominion universal, and his essence infinite. It is unwise, of course, to attribute Newton's discussion of God and his attributes to any single author, however plausible, and I don't wish to belabor the point. Rather, in suggesting the need to consider a broader intellectual background to the ideas presented in the scholium, I also wish to point out the need to scrutinize more closely the immediate context of its composition. Newton embarked on the composition of the scholium by January 1713 within months of the publication of Samuel Clarke's Scripture Doctrine of the Trinity. And the second edition of the Principia was published six months later. This publication proximity, amplified by the congruity between key notions in the scholium and Clarke's book, naturally invited speculations regarding influence. 
or even a coordinated effort. Without denying such a possibility, it remains clear that the scholium intended to rebut not only Cartesian critics of the Principia, but especially Leibniz. As Alan Shapiro demonstrated, Newton's resorted for the first time in his career to the term experimental philosophy in a concerted effort to defeat and to defend the theory of gravity along with the scientific methodology. <coughs> Similarly, his discussion of God intended in no small part to rebut Leibniz, Leibniz's position expressed most recently in the Theodicy and in his correspondence with Nicholas Hartzoeker, and especially the concept of intelligentsia supermundana. <coughs> Contemporaries recognize this polemical context, and consequently few actually consider the scholium to represent a deliberate attempt by Newton to intervene in the debates over the Trinity. Rather, the appropriation of the scholium by zealots, by zealots of diverse persuasion ensnare Newton's name and reputation in various debates for decades to come. First and foremost among such zealots was William Whiston. A self-proclaimed disciple of Newton, Whiston actually lost favor with the great man in the early years of the 18th century. First, on account of his imp uh, imp impudent forays into prophecies, then, as a result of, his, of the boisterous manner in which Whiston opted to advertise his commitment to anti-Trinitarianism, finally, and most importantly, because Whiston chose in 1711 and 1712 to publicly implicate Newton as a fellow traveler. Whiston retaliated within a week of the publication of the second edition of the Principia on, ju in ju on July 1st, 1713, by rushing through the press a translation of the theological portion of the scholium printed as an appendix to his anti-Trinitarian three essays. Whiston prefaced the translation by informing the reader that the scholium represented Newton's most serious and inmost thoughts regarding God himself, his unity, supremacy, dominion, and other attributes. Nay, to state the proper scripture ac accepted acceptation of the word God when applied to any other than the supreme being himself the mistake about which has long been of the most fatal importance. Finding the scholium not at all disagreeable to his present design, therefore, Winston sought proper to conclude his essays with a translation thereof. In all likelihood, Winston's translation drew John Edwards' attention to the scholium. This rigid Calvinist and stalwart opponent of each and every new scientific idea since the 1690s it fiercely battled Winston's anti-Trinitarianism since 1711. No sooner had Samuel Clarke's Scripture Doctrine of the Trinity published in 1712 that Edwards targeted the latter too. In fact, Edwards scarcely doubted that Winston got Dr. Clarke to back him in his heretical persuasion, and such a conspiratorial frame of mind informed Edwards' reaction to the scholium as well. In a postscript, he added in 1714 to yet another attack on Clark, just as he discovered Newton's scholium, Edwards charged that Newton and Clark, having lately conferred notes together, as it is thought, it was decided that Newton would add his odd notions regarding the deity to the new edition of the Principia, and thereby appear in favor of those notions which Dr. Clark had published. <coughs> The odd notions refer to Clark's assertion that God is a relative word, which Edwards charged Clark had borrowed from the Socinian Johann Krell, and which Newton has now picked up. Expressing bewilderment at the meaning of Newton's conception of, of God's dominion and how it related to Newton's attribution to God's body, to God the body, Edward suspected the influence of Spinoza's conception of the deity. Before continuing, it would be useful to document the rapid dissemination of the scholium. Winston persisted in publishing it. In 1717, he included a, a translation in the Astronomical Principles of Religion, and six years later, he placed it underneath a striking broadside engraving of his scheme of the solar system. In 1728, dissatisfied with the cursory manner in which the scholium had been treated in the view of Sir Isaac Newton's philosophy, Winston urged his author, Henry Pemberton, to, a, to, a, to append his own corollaries from Newton's philosophy and, and chronology to the book, but to no avail. Undaunted, Winston published the corollaries himself, 
using the same paper and size as Pemberton's and proceeded to advertise it as a work suited to be bound together with it. By then, the third edition of the Principia had been published with a revised version of the scolium and Mot with Mot's uh, English translation of the Principia following in 1729. A flurry of other partial translation and excerpts ensued. Ephraim Chambers' Cyclopedia of 1728 prominently featured the scolium along with a partial translation at the opening of the article God. In 1731, the Grab Street Journal printed a partial translation of the scolium under the provocative title The Newtonian Creed. Sardonically praising Pemberton's efforts to render the Principia more intelligible, the author of the article urged Pemberton to go further, furnishing clear and distinct notions of the Lord God, as well as explaining the import of the scolium's creed, evidently composed by Newton, he said, in imitation of St. Athanasius' creed, to convince the world that his religion was as much above that of the vulgar as his philosophy. Such flurry of publications undoubtedly reflected broad interest in an intriguing and accessible Newtonian text. However, in order to properly appreciate the scolium's fortunes, it is necessary to recognize that by and large, it was not viewed as a provocative contribution to current doctrinal disputes. Few contemporaries saw reason to quarrel with Newton, whose public conduct had been beyond reproach, even though rumors regarding his less than orthodox private beliefs circulated freely. Furthermore, notwithstanding his intimacy with Samuel Clark, Newton definitely remained aloof of the latter's religious activism, not to mention his displeasure with Winston's far more belligerent polemics, a distancing that contemporary and later anti-Trinitarian bitterly resented. With such a background in mind, we can return to the scolium's entanglement in the anti-Trinitarian debates. In 1720, John Cumming, the Presbyterian minister of the Scottish Church in London re responded to a letter by a co-religionist, John Evans, who attempted to resolve amicably a serious conflict that raged among dissenting ministers <laughs> over the extent to which plain scripture consequences are to be regarded as a matter of revelation, and in particular, insofar as the doctrine of the Trinity is concerned. Cumming responded with a lengthy treatise in the course of which he controverted, in one little footnote, Newton's notions regarding God's dominion. To re the rebuke was incidental to his purpose, and as Evans noted in his rebuttal, Cumming lifted much of the critique from John Edwards without bothering to read the scolium. Had he done so, Evans argued, Cumming would have realized that Edwards quoted out of context when, this, when insinuating that Newton maintained uh, anthropomorphic notions regarding God. The early reproaches of the scolium clearly indicated how marginal was the scolium to the overall critique of anti-Trinitarianism. At the same time, these writers exhibited a marked deference to Newton, in stark contrast to the handling of Clark or Whiston. Who would have thought, Edwards remarked, that such wild jargon as this could come from the pen of a great man, and so cultivated the judgment as Sir Isaac Newton, who has justly merited the applause of the learned world to his admirable efforts in natural philosophy and mathematics. Hence, he would have been infinitely glad to be convinced that a person that merits, uh, that merits no such censure uh, would have done differently. Cumming improved on Edward's rhetorical question. Whether the conceptions of God's dominion was originally Newton's own or was added by another hand, I will not determine. Whoever was the mathematician who composed it, the expression of God's proper body in the scolium is exceeding gross and unphilosophical, not to say atheistical. And I wonder, it should come in here, it being uh, enough to spoil the reputation that the authority of so great a man could give to the distinction between the true God and the supreme God. But then, coming concluded in an exculpating manner that would become common in subsequent years, the most profound philosophers are not always the fittest men in the world to explain divine things, and the greatest mathematicians may be sometimes out in the metaphysics. The cycle of praise and blame proved a recurring pattern. In 1751, Robert Clayton, Bishop of Cloguer, 
published an essay on spirit, in the course of which he appropriated Newton's sentiments regarding God's dominion as congruent to his. After quoting from the scholium, Clayton concluded, so that the Son becomes our God, not so much on account of his having been employed in our creation, as because all judgment is committed unto him, this being the greatest obligation of all duty. Clayton's treatise engendered a major controversy, and the enlisting of Newton called for a response. Thomas Randolph retorted evasively, I could wish that Clayton had rather brought proof from scripture than from Sir Isaac Newton on so important a doctrine. I have a just esteem for that great man and willingly acknowledge his excellent abilities and wonderful discoveries in natural philosophy. But if I'm, requ I'm required to take my notions of the deity from him or to learn from him what or why I may worship, I must desire to stand excused. William Joseph, uh, Jones of Nayland, who noted Clayton's borrowing from Newton his sentiments regarding the grounds of for worshiping God, and offered an uncharacteristically vague retort. I would hope that the great man never intended to make so bad an use of it. A generation later, it was Henry Taylor's turn to implicate the scholium in his massive defense of the Apollinarian heresy, the apology of Benjamin ben Mordecai, not me, to his friends for embracing Christianity. Introducing Newton's conceptions of God's dominion, Taylor argued that the Jews, as well as neighboring nations, all understood the word God in the same plain and unscholastic sense in which it was understood by the most ancient fathers. As it is explained by Sir Isaac Newton, the greatest man, that, was, that ever appeared among the moderns, whether we considered him as a philosopher or a divine. One of Taylor's critics, John Whitaker, proved exceptionally harsh on Newton, who he believed had been the originator of the notions regarding Christ to have been only by a, an angel by nature and, and a god by investiture, which Clayton and Taylor had subsequently molded into form. In addition to refuting such a wild whimsy, Whitaker took him took aim at a strange assumption derived expressly from Newton, calculated only to bolster up a sinking cause and, and proving how weakly a wise man can think when he is an Aryan, which says that a being who governs all things as Lord of the universe is styled Lord God upon account of his dominion, for the word God is a relative term. This principle, which I guess thundered, is big with infinite monstrosity, laying the existence of God himself dependent upon that of his creatures. The marginality of the scholium to early 18th century doctrinal debate that I cannot continue to elaborate here may be best inferred for its conspicuous absence from most polemics over the Trinity. Daniel Waterland, the most prominent defender of the orthodox position, never mentioned the scholium, nor did his numerous minions. For all of its suggestiveness, I submit, most contemporaries recognize that Newton did not intend the scholium to serve as his, as his salvo in the raging debates, and consequently, as noted above, he was rarely attacked or even mentioned, except by a few anti-Trinitarians who either hoped to draw Newton out more publicly or capitalized on his reputation. In view of this, I would like to challenge the received view that contemporary readers immediately recognize the precise concordance between the the 17th century uh, 13 Principia and Clark scripture doctrine, and that they reacted accordingly. Thus, it would be wrong to insinuate that in 1714, an anonymous Trinitarian polemics had Newton's moral interpretation of John 10.30 in mind when insisting that the passage actually taught that God and Christ are one in nature, essence, and power. For the author expressly targeted wisdom here and elsewhere in the pamphlet. Likewise, when William Stephens derided eight years later those who have placed the unity of the Godhead not as it ought to have been as a unity of substance, but in a unity of monarchy and government, he explicitly identified his opponent by citing at length, at length from Clark's scripture doctrine. If Newton was on his mind, he certainly did not mention him, nor did he have to. For the matter at hand, Clark's writing furnished far more than could be found in the scholium more fully documented, more amply articulated, as well as openly and forcefully challenging the Trinitarian doctrine. 
I should not be understood to mean that contemporaries did not read or comment on the metaphysics of the scholium. They certainly did, and I shall address this particular legacy in the final version. I only wish to distinguish such discussion from doctrinal debates over the Trinity, notwithstanding the obvious overlap between the two domains. Contemporaries, in other words, would have agreed with Newton's pronouncement in the scholium. To treat God from phenomena is certainly part of experimental philosophy. Had they been privy to Newton's private opinion, religion and philosophy are to preserve distinct, an opinion Newton considered adding to a subsequent edition of the scholium, most would have acquiesced as well, even if grudgingly. Consider John Jackson. This champion of Clark intimated to the latter in January 1716 uh, of his finding Newton's conception of the true notion of God to be exactly agreeable to Clark's scripture doctrine. Yet, when Jackson published later that year another spirited defense of Clark's anti-Trinitarianism, he saw no reason to cite the scholium. Conversely, however, when, when Clark published his, uh, in the following year, his correspondent with Leibniz, he had no qualms in liberally availing himself of the scholium in his notes. To conclude, <coughs> armed with comprehensive knowledge of Newton's religious opinions, historians tended on the one hand to over-interpret the anti-Trinitarian import of the scholium, as well as Newton's motivation for publication. On the other hand, they mistakenly assumed that contemporaries who had no access to Newton's papers nonetheless recognized the magnitude of Newton's heresy in the scholium. Indeed, it is even been argued that at least some contemporaries reckoned the Principia to be even more pernicious than Newton's posthumous religious publication had been. And I would argue late in, uh, uh, subsequently that matters of course change after 1728 and 1733 when Newton published respectively, the chronology and uh, uh, the prophecies. Then the context became far more uh, expansive for his theology. But again, the scholium was, uh, uh, for the most part, not part of those debates. In this paper, I've attempted to suggest not only that Newton's Arian sympathies were not as critical for the composition of the general scholium as it is commonly thought, but that the ideas therein contain Readily, readily available in numerous orthodox as well as heterodox works, were not perceived by contemporaries to represent an open challenge to Anglican orthodoxy. Hence the dearth of critical references to the scholium in raging theological polemics. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that was incredibly interesting. I think we might be converging on a view amongst the historians and philosophers to echo something that Scott mentioned yesterday. So tell me what you think of this. My current view, which I didn't have when I landed in Halifax <laughs> a few days ago, is that perhaps ironically, given what we've often thought over the years, and I think you're right about this, the general scolium even the passages that we take to be, let's just say they're about the divine, uh, was not theologically questionable from the point of view of many of Newton's contemporaries. In fact, it was philosophically questionable. And, and a lot of the debates that uh, are important in terms of the history of Newtonian thought after 1713 are focused on philosophical issues related to things we've talked about before with either Cartesian readers or sort of quasi-Cartesian readers or Leibnizian <coughs> readers who deny Newton's view of God, but they also deny Newton's view of the world generally and Newton's view of space. And, and so they see them as connected. Whereas theologically, a lot of the very same passages that are seen as philosophically suspect were actually taken to be perfectly reasonable from many different theological points of view. Does that accord with what you're saying? And, and if so, I think that's 
actually, well, I, that's to me I, I, quite an interesting convergence that we've reached. Uh, well, again, I think so. I mean, uh, I discovered large number of references to the scholium throughout the 18th century, both in England and the continent. And I think they, uh, they converge on this very gray area that we can call religion, metaphysics, and other aspects of philosophy. Uh, and it's a very rich uh, um, uh, uh, field. And I think what one of the things that I'm trying to do is to show how we need to look at it at, uh, in terms of time. Things are, ha are happening fast, and you know, if we just kind of extract citation, we will not understand the dynamics of the, uh, uh, the debates. But, uh, I mean, there are many and serious uh, 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 debates over the religious consequences, or the theological consequences of the scholium, uh, and they are important, but on the whole, I think that in so far as the Trinitarian aspect is concerned, that is not what's happening in the 18th century. And uh, 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 it does not diminish, of course, from Newton's own. I mean, I have evidence that contemporaries understood, and even before Voltaire advertised Newton's and the Trinitarian, <coughs> people knew about uh, his belief. But that, in a sense, did not matter. Newton was, in a sense, immune to that kind of open criticism. I mean, that, you know, it could be grudging, it could be, but that's not an issue that should focus our attention insofar as the scholium is concerned in terms of the legacy. And that's what I was trying to do. And Larry, of course, will disagree. <laughs> uh, Modi, uh, this may surprise you, but I really thought that was a terrific paper, and I'm, I can't wait to see the text. Um, but I was quite surprised to hear you say that the received view was that the general scolium was the result of Samuel Clark, and if that's indeed the case, I'm extremely gratified to hear it. S say it um, Sorry. However, um, uh, your point about not relying on anti-Trinitarianism, I, th I, think you, I think you have much to say. It's absolutely correct with regard to Whiston. Uh, Whiston is, for a lot of different reasons, a bit of a suspicious character, and he outlasts everybody anyway. So there's, 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 there's an argument to be made there. Uh, one point, though, I think, well, two, perhaps, where I think we might have a difference. Uh, first, with regard to uh, Edwards, it's prior to the general scolium that Edwards takes on Clark. Uh, this begins, and I'll just give you some amended adver versions on Samuel Clark's scripture doctrine, and then following immediately in the following year, a supplement thereto. But then, in the 1714 next step in that debate, which is so called some dis uh, discoveries of the uncertainties, deficiencies, and corruption, et cetera, et cetera. It is there that he explicitly refers to universal attraction. And so what I think is there is a folding in of Newton's general scolium from which then Edwards draws a certain kind of conclusion which may or may not, <laughs> not be wrong. But there are other instances of a, what a, is an explosive debate that is triggered in part by the appearance of general scholarly, but from which others derive very, <coughs> I think, very controversial conclusions, myself perhaps being one. And, and one of those was actually uh, referred to quite recently by Steve Duchesne uh, in a paper I heard uh, in July, I think it was, Reflections on the Resurrections of Jesus Christ, which talks about uh, substance. Uh, there's another example, Maxwell, of course, is being, being yet a mother, Cummings a little later on. Um, then, but, and I think this is important also to recognize, it's not just coming from the heterodox. The, 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 their concerns about what uses of anti-Trinitarianism anti may be put to and all of that. There's Edward Wells uh, in his uh, letters to Clark. There's Edward Hare, a bishop, uh, difficulties and discouragements which attend the study of scriptures. These are all in, in six to eight months following the general scholium. 
And all of them, to one extent or another, refer to the, to the scripture doctrine. Because it's actually, initially it's Clark that's the target. Clark is the one who is thought to be important for two really important reasons. One, he's, I think you're right, I think you mentioned this the other day, he's the superior metaphysician. And the second is, he's a rising star in the church. And the context of this attack has largely to do with the politics and convocation. So we may not differ quite so much as you think, because I think it's a very impressive approach. But I do think there are many instances in which, in ver very, very early days, where people come to the conclusion that the general scholium owes a lot to Clark. Now you can't, you can't blame uh, Newton for the reception, if I can put it that way. But I do think there are many other than the, the lunatics, if I can call it, mm -hmm. that, who draw the same conclusion. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Now, I mean, one of, my, one of the things that I really want to tie is to the extent that it is possible today to decouple, in a sense, uh, Newton from Clark. Because obviously the proximity on the one hand and the nature and the intimacy of the relationship on the other certainly could bring this. And you're right. There were some contemporaries that, that claim that uh, Newton deri derived his ideas from Clark. There were actually people who said the opposite. Mm -hmm. The Clark took it from Newton. So those existed. But what I find interesting by carefully looking at the sources is that even among those who fear that Newton is lending legitimacy, shall we say, to Clark, there is the recognition, well, maybe not so. I mean, yes, there are some congruity of ideas, but there is a very interesting way of exculpating Newton from such involvement. So, uh, in, so in the first few years, there are some rumblings about it. Then there will be some copying of it later. But by and large, I think that doesn't really exist. And I think if we realize that this particular issue is not critical to the reception, I think then we'll be able to better understand the religious influ uh, significance of the scolium throughout the 18th century. So it's, we, do, we don't disagree. We, we just need to, I think, look at the issues more critically and uh, 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 globally. <laughs> well, we don't want to introduce any historical specificity here, do we? Um, the, a good example that you yourself raised, John Jackson. You're absolutely correct that when he publishes, he doesn't dare, he, or he doesn't refer to any relationship. But what is very, very curious is in, in the letters that he writes to Clark, he refers to the way in which Clark and Newton's views absolutely coincide. Right. And so he's, and I think there is a kind of multitude of caution by the time he publishes. He, I mean, the, by then, of course, the debate is extreme. It's gone to the West Country amongst the Presbyterians. It involves the Scotch Church as well in London. So it doesn't surprise me very much that Jackson would have reserved the most inflammatory of his comments for a private, private uh, uh, co uh, correspondence with Clark. No, no, I mean, we, we basically, yeah. wonderful paper and I learned a lot from it. Um, um, I, I don't feel I was party to the dispute on their hands. I kind of witnessed great boxing match from my point of view. Um, I have um, 
a, a question about the extent of your play, about the significance of the Trinity <coughs> in the reception of the general scholium. And I also want to ask a general question connected to the theme of the conference that relates to your paper. Um, so a generation later after you take the story, we get a guy like Priestley who um, has his own interpretation of Newton's matter theory, has his own interpretation of um, how to understand Newton's methodology, and also has an anti-Trinitarian perspective that he, I think, quite legitimately, this package of claims, that's not the only way to read Newton, can attribute to Newton in various ways, and does so, and somebody like Reed is horrified by this um, package. Um, so one question I would have for you is, at what moment in your historiography do you see um, not just theologians, <laughs> but let's call them competent natural philosophers, create the mix of doctrines um, of the sort that you think are in some ways misleadingly um, attribute to the original reception? Because I do think that somewhere in the 18th century that starts to happen. Um, my second question is really unrelated, but I figure I might, might as well ask. Um, Voltaire um, famously says that uh, the general scholium is his metaphysical appendix and implies rather quickly that to understand the metaphysics of the Principia, we should not really focus on the general scholium. We should not read Clark, we should read Locke. So um, to me, this is like the missing chapter of this whole conference. And since you're, I guess, assigned part of that in your paper, I would love to hear something about how you think of that transition from, I guess, our shared contextual approach and somehow that Voltaire manages to very dramatically shift, not alone, of course, but the whole reception of this stuff I figured that would also be a nice way to conclude the conference, so I'll thank, give it to you. Thank you, Eric. Well, let me start with Voltaire. Uh, <coughs> of course, you're right, but this is the late Voltaire. In 1733, when Voltaire thought to publish the first edition of the, the, uh, uh, the summary of Newtonian philosophy, he intended, just like Newton, to add the final chapter on metaphysics. And that is the first chapter, we presume, of metaphysics of, of, of Messiah Newton. And that is just a scholium. He was not allowed to publish it, and then he reworked it, and then came uh, the kind of much broader view that, that you mentioned, which strengthened my argument regarding the need to understand how quickly things change. By 1738 and 1740, a great deal happened. For example, I mean, Scott mentioned a very interesting uh, Warburton uh, things apropos Pope essay on men. When Pope published the essay, which is based, based to a large part on Shaftesbury, there was a huge controversy about the irreligiosity of both individuals. So uh, in, the, in the fourth book of the Danciad, suddenly the scholium is invoked as showing uh, Pope's uh, 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 proper orthodoxy as opposed to Shaftesbury. So again, and that's all it all happens because Crusa attacked the essay on men. So we see kind of constant infiltration. You know, it's, it happened day by day almost between the continent within England, and that forces uh, 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 quick changes. So in order to understand what happens, I think we need to see kind of to start at point of origination and slowly move forward in the century to realize the richness and the complexity, which leads to the second question. Uh, surely, contemporaries recognize the way in which the scholium, as well as the Principia and Large, and I think Scott is, is absolutely correct in perception that the Principia had originated already uh, 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 since the first edition, to ideas, to the, uh, impinge, to the um, correlation of religious and scientific ideas. I mean, they are, after all, connected. Uh, 
And I think that, again, if we look at it sequentially, we realize that issues like matter and spirit, uh, even before Priestley, I mean, look at someone like, uh, like uh, Carl Walter Colden, when he kind of brings in his, his, his bombshell, uh, you know, just like, to I mean, it's, it's kind of almost like Toland. I mean, he's told in the colonies, <coughs> don't publish it, it's stupid. And he goes ahead and publishes it. And it, it creates, again, implicating Newton in where Newton would not have been like to do. Uh, 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 Priestley, who really is angry at Newton for being a coward, uh, is very conflicted about what to do with him. He exculpates him on one hand, he accuses him on the other, but by then it's a totally, it's a different ball game. So that's what, again, when I look at the legacies that, <laughs> Steve, I mean, I didn't realize how many, how much I left to work for it, for my, 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 my plane ticket, you know. <laughs> uh, the, the field is so rich and uh, it just requires uh, uh, a careful and serious unpacking in order to really understand how the scholium in particular and how the Principia in general was received in the course of the Enlightenment. I just have a couple of Final uh, remarks. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be, those involved in the um, uh, delegates and those involved in uh, what we hope will be a publication, uh, we're going to meet uh, across the hallway in uh, the Frazee Room. Uh, this will be an in-camera session without a camera. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but on that point, I, I thought it would be um, appropriate to uh, thank uh, Chuck uh, Calder for uh, his uh, fine uh, professional uh, work as our videographer uh, today. <laughs> and uh, at some point in the near future, we will, we will see ourselves uh, in those uh, videos. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, offer a couple observations. Uh, one, one of them is uh, I've been impressed by uh, what I think are, everyone will agree are the benefits of the collaboration uh, that we uh, have engaged in over the last uh, two days. Um, and I think it's, for a text like this, as small as it is, it's a very interdisciplinary text. And certainly this is one of the ways we pitched this uh, to King's, because King's is, is known as an institution that uh, uh, works in an interdisciplinary kind of tradition. And so this text, of course, spans the humanities and uh, the sciences. But, but in that light, also, uh, the benefits of bringing uh, historians and philosophers together and, uh, a number of, of you have commented that this is uh, not an uh, altogether common uh, occurrence. Um, so there are some benefits. Uh, I think you know some of the differences in the culture uh, showed up occasionally uh, this weekend, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's a, a worthwhile uh, experience. Um, so I just wanted to thank uh, all the delegates for traveling very great distances uh, to be here. And uh, I've been able to enjoy this, sleeping in my own bed, <laughs> having all these Newton scholars uh, come and uh, create uh, for three days uh, <coughs> the international epicenter of uh, Newton studies in uh, this humble city of uh, Halifax. So thank you very much. Uh,